Memorialized in locally quarried stone, in red bricks and orange tiles, Oliver and Oaks Ames, side by side for eternity, gaze upon and silently manipulate the complex of shops which magnificently proclaim the entrepreneurial successes of these brothers. The Rockery, the first and the most unusual design created by Frederick Law Olmsted in Easton, 1881, was by a commission given to that landscape architect by Oakes Anger Ames and Governor Oliver Ames. The intent of the design was to be a Civil War monument and also to be a viewing point for the adjacent Oakes Ames Memorial Hall and Ames Free Library. Olmsted may have envisioned his creation as a kind of a public square about which would be gathered the designs of his friend Henry Hobson Richardson and a school then but a bit to the south. The rockery soon after the placement of the massive boulders which define it and prior to any vegetative plantings loomed as a fortress surrounded by the moats of Main Street, Lincoln Street, and Barrow Street. The natal rockery with its walls of virgin and immense rocks may not be greatly dissimilar to the exterior walls of the Gate Lodge at the Langwater Estate. The mover of the ice epoch willed to the Eastern community an abundance of stony building material some of it which was arranged for the wonder of an analysis by humankind. The rockery, with an archway running through it, that archway having as its functional assignment an easy departure from our access to Main Street and Lincoln Street and its aesthetic assignment of echoing the Romanesque arches of the Richardson buildings was and continues to be a portal, an imposing entrance. Here, many have delightfully viewed the panorama of the Ames monuments. Here, school children on selected holidays have brought and laid at the base of the giant flagpole their offerings of stones, symbolizing remembrance and recollection. Here, many have swayed and tapped to the rhythms and the tunes of whole, whole and half notes projecting from the band shell. Here many have savored the joy of buttered and salted popcorn. Here many have awaited the arrival of the morning and afternoon mail deliveries. And here many have shared a first, an impulsive, and a controlled hug and bus. Here many have gathered about the monument honoring those who served in World War II and the Korean conflict. Here many have gathered to revel in the spirited festival of lights, exemplified on the 16th of December in the year of our Lord, 1994, by Thomas Grant, who sought the hand of Siobhan Donovan beneath the rockery arch, resplendent with the beauty of the glittering festive lights of the holiday season. A decision was made in or near to the year of 1947, which resulted in the commencement of the demise of the rockery. The operation of dismantlement 
commenced on the eastern end of this granite outcropping. For a reason or reasons now not easily recalled, a decision was made to halt the eradication of the rockery. The portion of the eastern end, which has been removed, has not been restored. In 1975, the year in which the town of Easton celebrated its bicentennial, one of the many proposals to highlight this celebration was the restoration of the partially deformed rockery. That proposal was not fulfilled. The decision to not remove the rockery was, for we who continue, a blessing. This portal of Easton continues in its function of providing a door, a gate, to the accumulated gifts which are personified by the rockery. The Arch at the Gate Lodge. The knobby texture of the exterior walls of the gate lodge of the Langwater Estate is simultaneously a toxin and a bomb. The exterior walls of the gate lodge simultaneously sicken or soothe the seer. The healing and the common link of these extremes is the generous Romanesque arch which is a renowned portal of Easton. Under the watchful eye of the squinting window just above the arch, time and people have passed to and fro. Sir Frederick L. Ames commissioned Mr. Henry Hobson Richardson in 1880 to design a gate lodge to be sited at the northern entrance of Langwater. The intent of Mr. Ames was that the new building would be a residence and not simply an outbuilding much subordinate to the main residence. In honoring the request of his client, the gate lodge developed into a two-story residence block to the west of the entrance lane and a single level wintering house to the east of the entrance lane. The Romanesque arch served a number of needs of the architect. The arch allows a framed and a sheltered entry into the estate and the arch provides a horizontal transitional vehicle which effectively connects two units of differing heights. The arch connects and vis visually melds the two distinct units into one entity. The arch does well its assignments. This outstanding portal of Easton reminds us of an age of elegance. This portal of Easton, this doorway to the romance of history, is a visual reminder of the generous inheritance which honors the citizens of this town. Hi, I'm Bob Mizowitz, your host for our weekly program, The Portals of Easton. We're going to travel back through time and explore historical sites, hear ghost stories from the past, meet people who will tell us what life was like growing up in Easton many years ago. Won't you come along? In this journey, we're going to get acquainted with Ed Hands, teacher, historian, author of Eastern's Neighborhoods. Ed Hands, the man, the author. Friends, we're going to spend an evening with a man who has explored the portals of Eastern's past. Enjoy with me. 30 years ago was uh, a lot less well developed than it is today. Uh, I lived out on the Bay Road at that time, and there were still working farms there. As a matter of fact, I lived on a poultry farm. Right next door to us was a dairy farm. Up the road was uh, another working dairy farm that uh, supplied milk for producers' dairy. And um, it was uh, kind of uh, uh, almost a 19th century existence. We'd ride up and down the road on our bikes and play football and baseball and fish in the summertime. and. Uh, uh, to me, looking back on it, doesn't seem much different than some of the people I read about at the turn of the century or, or earlier. 
uh, once we came to the big city up here in Northeast, and of course, uh, we had excellent education. Um, things were uh, pretty much state of the art. Uh, we were at that point um, growing fairly rapidly, even though we didn't perceive it. And so um, we moved into um, a relatively new high school building when I went into 10th grade. And uh, by the time I came back here uh, as a senior in college to student teach, uh, they were in the process of adding an addition onto that. Uh, that's the junior high school building now. Uh, and then, of course, we eventually built the new high school. So uh, I came in at just the beginning of the, the period of uh, the great growth. But uh, when I was here, places where there are subdivisions today was all woods. And uh, I, can, I have no sense of direction. So I, was, I managed to get myself lost in most of those woods. And that was a real education about Easton. Well, the most memories. Uh, is uh, is Bay Road, uh, where I lived, uh, and um, strangely enough, we, when we were just finishing up the book, um, my editor Hazel Varela noted that I should mention all the milestones on Bay Road, other than the four I had put in the text. And it was really funny. The one that I had left out was the one that was in front of the house uh, where I lived when I first came to Easton, and I said, you know. That's the reason I'm interested in the history of Easton, because that stone was such a mystery to me when I came here as a 12-year-old that uh, I began to read Reverend Chaffin and look around and pay more attention to the cellar holes and, and things like that. Well, I've always been interested in history, and I became particularly inspired after I found out that my first choice of careers, which was being an engineer, wasn't going to work because my math skills weren't quite there. Uh, but uh, I could also say I was inspired by several people that uh, I had in, in high school. Uh, Hazel Varela and uh, Buddy Worcester both uh, inspired me and pushed me in the direction of Easton's history, showed me how fascinating it really was. And uh, I've been happily... So Buddy did this through his English? He well, English I had him for English, and uh, he inspired a love of great literature there. I also had him for driver ed. And uh, he, knew, he knew I was interested in history, so he was always telling stories there uh, as he was, you know, clutched white knuckled to the, to the car uh, about uh, all the different spots that we passed by. And I remember making a promise to him. I said, one day I'm going to write a, a history like Chaffin did. And uh, this, is, this is my start. <laughs> Let's explore the pages of Easton's history. Historians in general in the 19th century um, were more or less interested in telling the story, getting the facts down, and um, in local history in particular, uh, making sure that nothing was lost, so that local histories tended to be very, very detailed. But historians in the 20th century began to look at the whys behind the fact. Why were uh, houses built here in Northeastern? Uh, why were... Um, certain areas of the town undeveloped. Um, what was the interaction like between the, uh, the immigrants and the, and the, the Yankees? Um, and I tried to answer some of those questions. The original question that I started with was, um, why did the original settler settle where he did? And that turned out to be the central foundation for the whole book because I believe he settled where he did because, because of the potential water supply there. Then as I began to look at the other neighborhoods, uh, everything began to fell in, fall into place. Neighborhoods got development uh, if they had water supplies. Um, and Northeastern with the best uh, water power became the, uh, the largest and best developed of the neighborhoods. There are exceptions. Easton Center has absolutely no water power at all except Black Brook, which you can jump across even in the spring. Uh, but uh, it was at the center of everything and uh, um, it became a common meeting ground. Well, the largest neighborhood in terms of pages in my book is Northeastern. Now, the folks down in Eastendale said, gee, we never wrote down our history because they told us it wasn't important. Only Northeastern was important. Uh, but that's not true. Um, Northeastern was the largest uh, in population for quite a while. It was also, um, back in the uh, turn of the century era, uh, the first one to have district government, where it had its own police department, fire department, and water department. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, those evolved, and, and the, those of other districts in town, evolved into the town systems that we have today. Mm -hmm. what, 
Ed, what distinguishes Northeastern from the other nine neighborhoods? Well, in the 18th century, what distinguished Northeastern was the tremendous power of the Quisid River, which drops about 30 feet as it passes through Northeastern. That led to um, the development of the Shovel Company in the 19th century, because Oliver Ames was attracted by this source of power. Once the Shovel Company got here, Northeastern took on the traits of uh, an urban neighborhood, unlike all the others in Easton. Did vocations cause the development of the neighborhoods in any way? Yes. Um, my thesis is that uh, it was the water power along the, f the uh, four river systems in town that attracted the early settlers. Water power was an opportunity for industry. The neighborhoods that didn't have a stream running through it were developed later and were primarily agricultural. So there was definitely a difference. However, I think the idea of neighborhoods really coalesced around the idea of the uh, local grammar schools. Hmm. Interesting. Why did you choose the ten neighborhoods to write about? Why not four or two or three? Well, that ties into the idea I just mentioned about the, uh, the grammar schools. In the mid-19th century, there were uh, scheduled to be 11 grammar schools in Easton. Remember, there were no school buses in those days, so the school had to be within walking distance. Uh, ultimately, 10 of those schools were built. Mm -hmm. And um, that became the framework for um, the idea of 10 neighborhoods. Some of the neighborhoods are well known, such as uh, Pequannacat or Eastern Furnace or Northeastern. Um, what about look, Unionville? Uh, and not, not, not to forget Unionville, one of our smaller neighborhoods, but certainly one that's had a lot of interesting history. Um, the other neighborhoods, like the Haywood Pool neighborhood and the Howard neighborhood, once originally shared a school, mm -hmm. but um, because the Howard uh, neighborhood was primarily agricultural and the Haywood Pool neighborhood had uh, a, a, a stronger mixture of part industry and part agriculture, I decided to make them separate neighborhoods. So it doesn't quite match the 10 grammar schools, but almost. And also makes for a longer book. That's right. right. Well, I think uh, Easton was uh, an inventive town because of uh, Yankee ingenuity. And I, and I guess that also goes back to the cliche Necessity is the mother of invention. If you look at Easton in the late 18th century, you find out that the farmland had been pretty much divvied up uh, among sons and grandsons to such an extent you really couldn't make a great living as a farmer. Um, and within 20 years of that, uh, new land opening up in New York and then further west in Ohio and Illinois made it even more of a challenge to be a general farmer here. So a lot of uh, sons, took what um, was a relatively good education. Um, you know, there's some great stories about the, how poor education here was in, in, in Easton. Uh, we once hired a, a crazy minister to be a school teacher. Um, he failed as a minister because he gave sermons from sun, sun up to sun down, only stopping when the sun went down, but I guess they found that useful in the teacher. Um, even though the education was kind of questionable compared to some more affluent communities, uh, there was enough education here that um, people could seek out um, other ways of making a living than being a farmer. Uh, there was also that water power with grist mills and sawmills, and around 1800, uh, it became apparent that water power could be used to turn uh, machineries to make textiles. And then people began to think of other things, like making nails with water power, uh, making wire with water power, um, coming up with a whole line of, uh, of inventions. So anybody that had an idea was free to try it. And um, unlike today, when getting an idea to market might cost a few million dollars, if you could get $1,000 in capital, you could get started. Uh, and uh, a number of people here in Easton did that. My favorite inventors are probably the pool family of Easton, uh, mainly because I've done a lot of research on them uh, along with a friend of mine, Bob Vogel, who is the leading collector of, of pool memorabilia. And uh, that's a real fascinating story because uh, they were making precision mathematical instruments, surveying instruments, um, coming up with some designs on their own, and competing with the Europeans who had uh, a several hundred year head start and uh, access to better tools and things like that. And they were, they, they were able to sell successfully uh, throughout most of the 19th century, meeting that competition. So that's a, a great success story. 
Um, on the other hand, um, some of the textile people here were a, a great surprise to me. I knew, you know, Easton is famous for its, sh its shovels, and I knew there were a lot of uh, um, sawmills and, and grain mills and things like that around. But it was easy to forget that once upon a time there were a lot of little textile and thread factories in town. And some of these people, the Morse family in particular, were very inventive. Um, one of the Morses even invented a lace making machine. How do you think Easton has changed through the years? Well, from, from my perspective in writing the book, the boundaries of the neighborhoods have, have joined together. It's become more and more one town. Uh, up until the 20th century, uh, there were still heavy, heavy controversies between the various parts of town. And I think that is beginning to fade away, although every once in a while you, you know, hear about, well, our fire station isn't open and the northeastern one always is, things like that. But um, that's beginning to fade away as, the, as transportation and, and growth have made the town into more of one unit. Um, other changes are that it's, it's gone from being a farming community to a community where there were, uh, was a lot of industry. Don't forget that the Ames Shovel Company made three-fifths of the world's shovels at one time uh, to be in a bedroom community where there's uh, very little business. Uh, excuse, I shouldn't say business. There's quite a bit of business still, but there's very little industry. It's all commercial enterprises now. Right. Um, why do you think Easton is a unique community? Well, it's unique in several ways. From a historian's point of view, uh, people save things around here. The documentation of the 18th and 19th centuries is particularly good. There's a lot of material left around. Um, it's also unique in that uh, it had a, a huge uh, industrial site, and yet it never had any labor strife. It was a, it was a community that was able to avoid uh, the problems that plagued other uh, industrial towns. Um, it also kind of just grew. It wasn't a planned community, and it's fun to watch the, uh, the different patterns of growth. The, each neighborhood has a unique pattern of growth. Well. A favorite ghost story would be one that would make the, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, you know? I mean, some, some ghost stories don't do very much for me. There's, there's a, a ghost story about uh, people in a house and hearing rocks fall on their roof, and it doesn't scare me very much, you know? You, those kind of stories you begin to look around for, like, rational explanations. But um, the Daniel Wheaton house has the one that makes, makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. and. It's a very harmless ghost, but it, it seems to be incredibly persistent. As a matter of fact, it may be more than one ghost. Um, many, many years ago, the Globe did a, uh, an article on um, ghosts of New England, and they happened to have a motorist story. And this motorist was driving down Bay Road uh, near the Wheaton House on a foggy, foggy night when uh, he was forced to slow down because he saw a, a, a lantern ahead of him. It was an old-fashioned lantern. It wasn't a flashlight or anything like that. And as he slowed down, the beams of his headlights caught the lantern and the ghostly figure in white of a woman walking across from the barn to the main house. That's a nice story. But in doing research on the house, you begin to find out more about this ghost. One of the earlier occupants of the house reported seeing the ghost in the center window above the door, a, a woman in white staring out the window. Uh, another person that lived in the house told the story of being in the house alone and hearing someone, she knows not who, whistling um, Yankee Doodle. So this one makes, gives me the creeps because it seems to be the most definitive ghost in Easton. It's not one sighting, it's repeated sightings uh, over a number of years by different people. And um, you know, you wonder. Maybe there is something to this. I had an, another interesting ghost story um, about a house nearby here, and it was told to me by a, uh, a person who, uh, over the phone, I never, never did get a chance to meet him, uh, who had uh, lived in Quisit House for a while, and he reported seeing ghostly figures there. Uh, a wizened old man who came into his room uh, when he was uh, uh, kind of half asleep, and stayed staring at him at the end of the, end of the bed for, he, he said, oh, it seemed like hours he, he was there. And then he reported um, seeing uh, a, a ghostly uh, woman 
in 19th century, um, late 19th century uh, maid's clothes, you know, high necked uh, um, blouse and with the long puffy sleeves. The, the typical housekeeper you see in these, in these 19th century movies, dusting furniture. Uh, and the thing that gave that kind of a, a little twist was he had, he had been so genuinely upset by these specters that appeared that he could no longer stay in the house. He, he moved out shortly after that. Uh, it makes you wonder, though, whether the ghost of Winthrop Ames is, is still there with a house full of servants. Uh, who knows? Ed, what was the biggest roadblock you had to overcome in writing this book? I think there were two. One was my own ignorance. Uh, I wasn't familiar with all the neighborhoods and, and all the intricacies of their history, so I was dependent upon written sources and interviews with other people, and that slowed down the writing of the book. The second one was um, the fact that almost no one has written down anything about the 20th century in these neighborhoods. The neighborhoods have kind of grown together as the town has expanded, but they still, for the most part, have unique identities. But none of that stuff has been recorded. We tend not to think of our own time as being historically important, and it is. So nobody to talk to then. Exactly. How is your book different from the history of Easton? I think it's different in several ways. The first one was that Reverend Chaffin lived at a time when you could just talk to people who in turn had talked to people who had lived in the 18th century. In other words, almost the whole history of the town was still part of the oral tradition. Uh, he was intent upon capturing as much information as possible. What that meant was a very long book with very little explanation of why things happened. He was so intent on capturing what happened. What I've tried to do is take some of his good stories, but put them in a framework, the framework of how uh, water power influences the development of neighborhoods. Whereas his chapters might deal with politics or industry, uh, my chapters each deal with a specific neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that leads to a little bit of repetition, uh, but it also leads to a greater focus on things that Chaffin neglected a little bit, such as uh, um, the important role that Easton played in the early textile industry, for instance, something we tend to forget because the shovel shop became such an, uh, a dominant force in town. Obvious question, is there going to be a sequel? No. <laughs> that was cute. What I'd like to do is not a sequel, but I'm hoping that the, that the publication of the book will trigger people's memories of things they have in the attic, memories of uh, early parts of the 20th century. And I ask in the book for people to send in any errors they find and also to send in any material that they think should be added. So at some point, I'd like to come out with a, a second edition, still based on the concept of neighborhoods. We'd like to thank Ed Hands for joining us for the first segment of The Portals of Easton. How good are you at Easton's history? Can you meet the challenge? Enter Cablevision's Historic Easton Trivia Contest. Now here's the question. What was on the street below the Rose Garden, which is now the road to Spring Hill Estates? Tricky question, remember. And your answer to David Andrews in care of Continental Cablevision, 15A Plymouth Drive, Southeastern Massachusetts, 023 Seven, five. Remember, the first person to send in the correct answer will be given this wonderful replica of an AIM shovel. These fine pewter shovels are available, by the way, at the Historical Society on the second Sunday of the month. The winner will be announced at the beginning of the next journey of Portals of Easton. We at Continental Cablevision hope you enjoyed your journey through the portals of Easton today. Don't miss our next journey in the exciting series.